right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Morgan at Politics and Pros, and I'd like to welcome you all to PNP Live. A few housekeeping items to go over before we begin. Tonight's event for China Room is pre recorded, and all audience questions were submitted prior to this recording. There will be a link at the bottom of the video to purchase China Room straight from PNP's website. Now, let's introduce tonight's guest. Sanjeev Sahoda is the author of China Room, Ours Are the Street, and The Year of the Runaways, which, is, which was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize and the Dylan Thomas Prize, and was awarded a European Union Prize for Literature. In 2013, he was named one of Granada's 20 best young British novelists of the decade. He lives in Sheffield, England with his family. Sahoda will be in conversation with Anjam Sundaram, the author of Stringer, A Reporter's Journey in the Congo, Bad News, Last Journalist in, the, in a Dictatorship, and the forthcoming Breakup, Diary from a War Zone. His writing has appeared in Granada, The New York Times, The New York Review of Books, and The Guardian. Please give our guests a virtual round of applause. So thank you, Morgan. And uh, I have the pleasure of speaking today with Sanjeev, uh, who is a friend and also a writer I greatly respect. And I'll, I'll ask Sanjeev to read briefly from his book, uh, you know, from the opening of his book. And just before that, perhaps just a little note, I met Sanjeev in 2017 at, in Sri Lanka at a literary festival. And he was actually telling me about the writing of this novel of China Room. And I was sharing him, with him um, the book that I was writing. And uh, so it was personally very exciting for me to actually read the finished product that he'd been telling me about sort of four years ago. And uh, with that, yeah, Sanjeev, feel free to, feel free to read from your book, um, um, which I had really enjoyed reading uh, last week. So thank you. Uh, thanks, Anjan. I could not be happier to be here with you. It's just great to see you um, again. Um, yeah, 2017, <laughs> that feels like that was a, well, it was, it was a whole different world ago, really, right now, wasn't it? Uh, when we were in close contact and, um, yeah, but yeah, thanks. Um, so I'll just read the first page of um, China Room, just a page and a half, so it won't take long. And... As it's a beginning, I don't think any context is, is needed, so I'll just jump straight in. Meher is not so obedient to 15-year-old that she won't try to uncover which of the three brothers is her husband. Already, the morning after the wedding, and despite nervous, trembling hands, she combines varying amounts of lemon, garlic and spice in their side plates of sliced onions and then attempts to detect the particular odor on the man who visits later that same night, invisible to her in the dark. It proves inconclusive, the strongest smell by far her fear. So she tries again after overhearing one of the trio complaining about the calluses on his hands. The concentration is fierce when her husband's palm next strokes her naked arm, but then too, she isn't certain. Maybe all male hands feel so rough, so clumsily eager and dry. It is 1929, summer is erupting and the brothers do not address her in one another's presence. Indeed, they barely speak to her at all. And she, it goes without saying, is expected to remain dutiful, veiled and silent like the other new brides. Spying from her window, she sees only the brother's likeness. Close in age, they share the same narrow build with unconvincing shoulders and grave eyes, serious faces that carry no slack features that follow the same rules. The three are evenly bearded, the hair trimmed short and tight, and all day they wear loose turbans cut from the same saffron wrap. Most hours the brothers will be out working the fields, playing, drinking, while she weaves and cooks and shovels and milks, until those evenings when Mai, their mother, says to her, raising a tea glass to grim lips, not the china room tonight. I think I'll leave it there. Excellent. Yes, a gripping beginning to China Room. And I'm, I'm, I guess the, the first question that I had um, is a broad question. All your novels have been sort of about <laughs> Asian themes. Um, 
But this one is perhaps uh, very personal uh, because it's based on your family history. And so I was curious if you'd like to tell the audience or how much you'd like to tell the audience at the outset about your family history, uh, what about it sort of inspired this novel? Um, yeah, were the characters uh, real people? Um, yeah, so I guess the seed of this story does lie in this kind of this family legend or this piece of family lore about my great grandmother. And I suppose it's one of those stories that gets passed down, you know, and it's something I've been hearing since I was um, quite young, that I had a great grandmother who was one of um, four women, actually, not three in, as it is, but one of four um, women who were married to four brothers. And none knew um, which man she was married to because ostensibly because they were kept sequestered from the from the men. And and it was in rural India, in the middle of you know, Punjab on a farm, where obviously there was no electricity, it was just very um, a very lonesome homestead that they kind of lived on, and, and the farm that still is in, in my family in Punjab. Um, and so the story goes, and how this story has been embellished over the years, you know, Lord knows, uh, that they didn't know who was their husband until a year later, and they saw who was holding which baby. And it was a story that was often spoken about with kind of a, a great deal of humour and levity, you know, in the way that we so often will patronise people that lived long ago, even when it wasn't even that long ago. But, um, I guess the more I thought about it, the more... It always seemed like quite a painful and dark kind of story to me. Um, and that, I suppose, so that, I suppose, was one of the impetuses for writing the book. Secondly, that room still exists. It still exists on, on the farm, which still exists, which is still in my family in, in Punjab. Um, and that room is still barred. And it's now, though it's now used as a grain store. Um, so I suppose those were kind of like the two prompts for or wanting to sort of like dig into this story and then but more though it took a long while for the story to take shape i started that story with this story of this great grandmother and i thought i was going to write this long epic dealing with immigration and, and so and these kind of these big kind of like um themes but that story kind of like died and i, I thought i was done with it until much later on when i started thinking of this other story about this, the unnamed narrator in the book and what he's going through. And, um, and so, as I said, there's these two stories in the, in the book, this 1929 story and this 1999 story. Once I got that 1999 story, which is um, loosely, uh, or which, which does have correspondences with my own life, the two stories seem to twine around each other. Um, they both seem to be talking about the same thing, which and I think in all my novels to date, the things that kind of does connect them is so there's ideas of freedom, of liberation, of wanting to sort of like um, escape a society in which you don't feel quite at home. Um, and I guess ideas of suffering seems to be quite key in all my books as well. When I look at Ours Other Streets, my first novel, it's, it's, a, it's a suffering of, of an individual in the other runaways, it's a group. And I suppose in this novel, it's more about suffering across time and how trauma kind of lives on through the generations in some in some kind of form. Um, so I suppose those are the kind of broader themes I'm, that I think kind of kind of connect my work and also the, the kind of the particular ideas that kind of gave rise to this novel. Right, and a, yeah, a powerful moment for me was when uh, in the 1999 story when this character who seems based on yourself, he sort of, he goes to the farm, to the homestead and he sees a room and uh, someone says to him, oh, are you, uh, are you are you Meher Kohl's uh, uh, great grandson? And sort of you realize the two stories are intertwined, and sort of her story is being lived in some way in the present. So it sort of talks, speaks to how that suffering sort of transcends or carries on through time in the yeah. form of characters. He li he lives the story, and it's obviously someone who is important for him. Yeah, yeah, and that was an important. Um... I suppose it was important. I didn't want to draw any kind of equivalence between them. They're both suffering in very different ways. They are both oppressed. They are both trying to, it's for both it's kind of a summer of reckoning. You know, the entire novel takes across 
takes place across three summers. So though there is an equivalence between the two, there is definitely a a companionship. I do I do see the both stories as as a kind of a mutual haunting. The narratives do haunt each other, um, and in, and some kind of idea that the two strands kind of they do kind of shake hands across across this divide of seventy years. And what was really one thing I really wrestled with when I was writing this, I was trying to write it, was how to write a Meher story. Like, what right does anyone have, you know, to put to put words into the voice of someone who, you know, who lived at one time, who, you know, to kind of like attribute actions and behaviours to us, which she may never have, or never have done, or probably would never have done. You know, what right? And the questions of authorship and who actually who can tell this story. Um, so I wrestled with that kind of idea a lot, and I, I, in the end, I'd, I ended up thinking, well, if not, if not me, or if not a version of me, then who else is going to give her voice? Who else is actually going to stand up and say that th this is a one possible narrative to do with this person who who did exist once upon a time? Um, so I started seeing it more as I started seeing the telling of a story more as more as an act of love rather than an imposition from someone seventy years later trying to think they can actually um, put words into this, this person's mouth. So questions of authorship are also just intrinsic to how this novel, this novel works. I think at the end, there's a real question about who is telling her story, this very neatly constructed 40 part story in which her life is kind of, which her, you know, her, an important part of her life is, is given over to, to the reader. Who is actually telling it? Is it, is it the narrator? Is, yeah, those, are, oh. those questions of authorship are really important, I think. And I'm curious, uh, what did it mean to you to this telling of her life, this telling of her story, the telling that you chose, the story that you constructed? How did it change how you saw her? And I'm curious if your family has also read the novel and how they received it and how they, it is one of many possibilities, but obviously different people have different information, different imagination. I'm curious what it's meant to the family and to you personally. Um. I don't, I mean, I think the family that are probably most aware of this legend or this family law, I don't think they've, you know, they're not, um, I assume, the, you know, my life as a writer doesn't really um, impose on their lives in any great way. And I'm, I'm afraid, I'm just, you know, I'm kind of like the slightly, you know, the strange family member who writes novels and does his thing. And that's fine. It, 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 it doesn't really take up much space in their heads. I think what I go up to or what my books are about. I don't think my books are widely read amongst my family, so family, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so there's not much. Um, so I can't actually say with any authority what they might think of my book. Though I, I, I would say I think my, you know, my, I was talking sort of tangentially about this story and what it might be like to tell it with my parents a couple of years ago. I mean, when I thought I might. Well, you know, I could see where the book was heading, and um, and you know, they said, you know, I think they're very aware that fiction is fiction, and though it, it speaks to a truth, it's also um, a truth that's um, open to um, conjecture and open to the, the author's kind of like telling. And you know, there's 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 a degree of sophistication about how fiction works. I think is what I say. So, I don't think there'd be any opprobrium coming my way for kind of inflecting her story in the way that I have done. Um, of how I feel about the mayor, it's, I mean, I do, as I said, I do feel like it's, it's, it's an act of love. And I feel she's given me a great deal. She's been extraordinarily generous in, in kind of giving me this, this narrative, you know, this kind of like this ability to tell her story. It's an act of great generosity on, on her part. And I hope, this uh, uh, something similar might be true in the other direction as well. I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, well, certainly, when I see photos of 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 my great grandmother now, it's it's I do linger over them much more. Yeah, I think. And the, obviously, there's a photo in the book as well. Clearly. Right. Yes, I didn't know whether to mention it because it's at the end of the book. But I lingered on that photo myself after having read the whole story, and you know, I identified the 1999 character as yourself. And then the protagonist is your great grandmother, and I realized both have come together in this picture. <laughs> yeah, did it, and that photo is mentioned early on in the narrative as well. In in the twenty nineteen yeah. bit of the book, where it's very much when the narrator or the unnamed narrator he goes to is 
um, goes to help out his parents because his father's had knee surgery. They need some help with the shop that they run. So he goes to lend them a hand. And that's very, that's sort of, that's directly true to life. You know, I, I did that. And, um, and he sits down and he sees that photo. And from that photo, kind of the pasts kind of open up. Um, so that very much happened. And for me, so the photo was always there from the beginning. It was really, I always knew I was going to end with that image of both of them together. Because for me, just not just because I think it it really tightens all those narrative strands for the reader in the reader's mind. Also, just from a formal kind of um, structural kind of perspective, I see the novel as like as structured as a spiral with these two strands, which start off with. So we start with quite long sections in 1929, 1999, and then slowly those sections get shorter, as if the two strands are twining around each other, spiraling around each other. And that photo at the end is almost like the point at which they become one and they just knock together, twist together in one kind of, in one, you know, they're kind of buttoned up in that way. So I see the photo as doing that kind of, that kind of formal structural work as well as doing the work of actually clarifying things, hopefully for the, for the reader in their own mind. Yep. And for the benefit of, of our uh, viewers here, perhaps it's helpful to clarify the book is written as two strands, as we've been talking, one is in 1929, one is in 1999. 1929, the protagonist is Meher Kaur, who's Sanjeev's great grandmother, or a character based on Sanjeev's great grandmother, who, yeah. um, along with uh, two other women, is married to three brothers, and none of the women know to whom they're married. And uh, there is a matriarch in the house, whom I'll get to shortly, uh, whose name is, who sort of rules the house. And uh, that is one world in 1929. In 1999, it's a character based on it sounds very much like Sanjeev himself, sort of a, a British person of Indian descent, sort of between just before university, going to university and sort of this gap year or experience in the China room, uh, the title of the novel, uh, on the homestead in India and sort of his love interests and his own sort of exploration, personal exploration. I'm suffering as Sanjeev mentioned. So those are the two strands that go through. Sort of, I, I had a question actually about, uh, uh, two questions about the 1929 strand, which sort of occupies the bulk of the book, uh, for me at least. Uh, it seemed to. Um, the first was the, the novel seems to be constructed around this, uh, this practice where the Mai, the matriarch, doesn't tell the women whom they're married to. The men, her sons, know whom they're married to, who their wives are. But the women don't seem to know who they're married to. And uh, that's, that's a sort of central practice, sort of a central tension at, at the heart of the novel. I'm curious, it, from the novel, from certain passages, I couldn't quite tell if this is tradition in many families or if this was Mai's personal construction or it's something peculiar to your family. Uh, yeah. no, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you couldn't tell. I didn't want to actually go down too heavily one way or the other. For me, I read it as my reading of it is that um, it was, it's almost a bit of awful bit of etiquette negligence that has happened. No one's actually thought to tell these women who they are actually married to. Because they were married in one ceremony, you know, and, and obviously when they were married, they were all completely covered from head to toe. And so then they're brought home and it speaks to the idea that they have no voice, they have no say, they have no actually, no one actually, they have no ability to feel or they're not expected to feel desire or feel as if they have any right to say anything or any right to actually any any purchase in this household so it starts off as being a bit of kind of, so this awful bit of horrendous bit of negligence and then when meher at one point does say to my who am i you know it, it is 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 the oldest one married to so and so then Maya realizes that they don't know. And then it becomes something she just plays on and she uses as a way to dominate and control um, the women and also control her sons as well. Um, so yeah, so, so it's, it's both, it starts off being something that someone's just, you know, because because they give so little thought to these to these girls, you know, they're 15, 16, 17, because you know, they've just been brought in to bear sons because they give so little thought to, to, to them and, and to what they might think or want. It, it, and then the thing just become, it just perpetuates itself, and um, then through my take, then my takes control and takes it to a whole other level, really. 
And I guess you brought brought up this other this second point that I, I was I was curious about the novel sort of the, among the main characters in the novel are Mai and Meher, and they sort of represent two sort of diametrically opposite positions that women in Indian society at that time. Mai is the matriarch; she controls the house, she controls even the men of the house, and uh, she decides. You know, near the end of near the middle of the book. There's a revolution, and you know they're calling for men to be conscripted, and and she she has authority over which of her sons, if any, get to go or don't go, um, and so she has this position of immense power. And on the other side, you have Meher Kaur, who's the main protagonist, who is a prisoner, uh, like a prisoner to her situation. Mm -hmm. But I'm curious, sort of exploring these two opposing sort of roles that women played that. What were your thoughts, or how, how did you approach this? Or yeah, what do you make of the position of you know, women in India? Yeah, I think with you know with my is I think it's it's necessary and important to remember what and the novel hints and lists what she has also gone through. That there's mm -hmm. intimation that she is also. Um, suffered in the way that Meher might have suffered when when Maya was also a new bride. There's intimations of you know of of her of what was done to her by the various men in her life um, when she was when she was young. So it's, it's so and obviously what she's done with kind of her suffering, she's internalized that misogyny. You know, she's very much sort of taken on board, and then she thinks that the only way she can actually get through this life is by taking on almost like a quite a, a very as she sees it as a very masculine and male persona the way she sits the way she kind of her bearing the way she talks it's all very much in what might be seen as like the way the way the men of that time would hold themselves and so the con the, the controlling domineering streak in her i think is as a result of her own suffering and her own trauma um and for mayor it's for me this for me that the entire her strand of the book is all about how she goes from how she is she's a very strong-willed spirited lively courageous brave young woman um, who in some very deep sense recognizes the injustice that is being brought upon her and for me the book for her is her journey towards a recognition that she her own her journey towards a control over her own personhood, that she does have the right to feel desire. She does have the right to actually have a say in her life. She does have the right to actually, a right to, um, a right to freedom or a sense of liberation. And it's interesting to me how her love for Suraj, or she sees her love for Suraj, how much is her love for Suraj, or actually a, is actually a projection of her desire for freedom. Does she really love him? Or is she actually just, does she see him really as a vehicle for escape and a vehicle to actually get to 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 escape from the China room, um, and also that ties in her desire for escape and her desire for self-rule ties in with the political backdrop of the novel. You know, it's a time when the entire country was, you know, on the march towards independence, self-rule, self-governance, having control over your own, designing your own wants. So. And it's interesting to me how that political, though I don't go into that into the political time in any detailed way, what I do want to do and how I think it, what I do think is what does happen is how the political world outside of what's going to, how it does climb into your home, into your bedroom and into yourself as well. And so Mayor, she's very much someone um, of a piece with that movement towards self-rule as well, which I don't think is, which, which was obviously not something Mai ever had an opportunity to, to, to take part in or to, 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 or to sort of imbibe in the way that Mayor does have that chance to sort of take on board. Right, and uh, what you say reminds me of this line that's stuck in my mind, I've just found it in the book now. And regarding Mayor's love for Suraj, she asks how much of her love for him is bound up with this promise of freedom, guilt, mm -hmm. freedom, creeps up on her, confusing her, and she looks away from him. Sort of yeah, yeah, and, it's like, and likewise with Suraj, I mean, so this idea of when, how much is Suraj's love for Mehr also bound up with, is always a projection of his desire to sort of, he says to destroy the world, to want to, you know, the, 
the difficulty he faces of being the youngest son who has no say in you know what he does or he feels yes compared to the other men and is living under this kind of this quasi tyrannical kind of regime in this family so how much is his love for meher also corrupted by his own desires or corrupted by the kind of like the the life um kind of like the brutality he is also living under so it's interesting how when you are in a situation all these two characters when they're in a situation where um they're both not allowed to be they're both not allowed to sort of as we might say in our modern parlance self actualize they're both not actually allowed to um be who they want to be how much of how how that does corrupt their love for how, how any kind of like love for them can't really manifest in 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 any kind of um pure or beautiful way it's always it's always going to be corrupted by the forces that are acting upon them the negative forces that are acting upon them um, i suppose today we talk about it in terms of gendered power, we talk about it in terms of gendered power dynamics but um obviously in those times they wouldn't have those terms to hand but still these power dynamics do still corrupt their their feelings for each other right and uh, actually this this innocence pervades the novel in a way it's kind of a seed and you, uh, i remember the, one of the most evocative chapters in the in the novel for me were, were is a scene from when meher is only 5 years old and uh, and she spits into a, in, on the coals uh, you know and watches her spit sizzle on hot coals and picks up three coals puts it in an iron and she's ironing uh, you know family's clothes and her brother comes up and asks her to iron a shirt for him and you get this sense of in, in very in a very few short paragraphs in a few pages uh, you have this sense of this girl who is strong willed from the age of 5 who is beautiful who is innocent who you know will try to make the world uh, as she as she wants it and sort of she transgresses later you refer to suraj and she sort of elopes and wants to run away with him which is a manifestation of that strong will and yeah yeah and so she she plays she plays pitu which I remember so it was a game when i was young and i used to go to india yeah. in the village. i used to play pitu as well and she's but she's much better at it than i than i ever was <laughs> and you're right there's early chapters those early chapters were written quite late actually when i realized I, I wanted that sense of who she was before she arrived in the china i wanted to get that just i, I thought it was important for us to to see that um, to see that live that that vivacity in her and how that does carry through and how her her drive is um um can't be sub despite my and despite the regime the the regime that's living that she's living under her drive still comes to the surface and she tries to you know she's you know i think she's enormously brave in what she tries to do and um and yeah 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 i have a technical question you know i'm i'm writing on uh, my first novel now and sort of i've been thinking about all these technical questions and i noticed and I thought it was an interesting choice that the 1929 story, whatever, almost a century now, you've written it in the present tense. And I'm curious why, why you chose the present tense and what that did for your story, just on a technical yeah. level. Yeah, and that's so, you're right, so the 1929 song is written in the third person present tense and the 29 strand is written in the first person past. Um, right. And that was always the case. I started when I started writing the Twenty Nine Strand. It automatically did come out as as present, as, as as being written in the present tense. And when I thought about it, and I thought about it long and hard, whether whether that was the right decision for me. The present tense is almost like it's the it's the uncontained tense. It's a tense that kind of it, it can't be. It's always trying to spill out of its present moment. So not in, if some people say. It makes present tense make something feel alive, or it gives it gives it an immediacy. And I don't I don't think that I don't think the present tense does that. But for me, what the present tense in this book does do, it points to because it isn't because the present tense can't be really contained. In, the past tense parcels things off, and the present tense doesn't really parcel things off in that way. But for me, the present tense in this book it points to the trauma to come for her great grandson. It says this isn't over yet. This will carry on, and we see it carried on in the ninety nine strand. So for me, that's what the that's what the present tense in this particular book, I think, um, or why I felt it was the right choice. It points to both the trauma that she suffered, also what's what's coming for her grandson, and also what might continue to come throughout the generations. 
because um, there is that line in the end of the book which says um which in the 99 strong way says the underlying hurt does not go away and can only be paid attention to the idea that trauma does does live on um so that's why i felt like the present tense was necessary in um, in yeah in that 29 strand it's very interesting because the 1999 strand is sort of your own story. It's your own past. And I'm curious in writing the pre uh, Meher's story, the 1929 strand in the present tense, I'm curious how it felt to live out Meher's core story and sort of uh, if it was challenging to write from a woman's perspective, from, even from someone whom you're related to, whom you've heard about since you were little. Um. Was it challenging to write for work? I, don't, I think I have quite, I have a really just, probably just a very basic and simple way of approaching character, which is probably mm -hmm. wrong, but it's just, it's simply that I think any and all characters can experience any and all emotions, regardless of, of their gender or of any other category that they might consider themselves in, which and it doesn't mean that they are always able to externalize or articulate their their feelings and of course the women in the 1920 can't you know they're not allowed to sort of like voice their passions in the way that the men can but they can certainly feel those they can certainly feel as calculated as wronged as ambitious as angry as happy as any other characters so i think once i start from that premise one thing that you know that the women can feel everything that the men can feel then i kind of i i think i just back myself to be able to write Mm -hmm. Write the female characters as, as as honestly as as any other character. I don't see that great a difference in the emotional makeup of of men and women, if I'm honest. Um, and I think perhaps that's why I never feel any compunction or any hesitation in entering the heads of of people that aren't like me, which is a vexed question these days. But I say I don't feel any. I feel it's, I almost feel like it's making that leap, making that kind of that, that attempt to understand someone who's very different to me. Inevitably, I'll get things wrong. Inevitably, I will make mistakes. We almost think um, the risk is worth it. What's gained from making that leap? But that whatever sort of understanding or whatever knowledge is gained is worth the risk of getting a few things wrong, I think. Very interesting. And so, yeah, that was my next question, actually. What did you... Uh... What did, what understanding did you feel that you gained, and how do you see your own family history differently, perhaps after having written China Room? Um, I suppose it's the idea of um, trauma living on, which I wasn't quite, which I didn't really, I wasn't really thinking. But I didn't, I didn't start these writing this book with these two strands with that idea in my head. It was only as I was writing it and I started seeing the similarities in these two strands. That not only are these both these characters, Meher and the unnamed narrator in the 99 strand, not only are they both, not only are these two strands connected by theme and um, ideas and, and motifs and signs and echoes and the mirrorings between them, but so not only are the strands connected, they're also two characters seeking connection as well. They're both mm -hmm. they're seeking connections in, and they're both seeking home, they're both seeking a place to belong, and they're both also suffering. And I don't think I quite understood how much of my work is concerned with ideas of, of suffering. Um, and actually the other thing I didn't understand about my work until I read this, until I started writing this book was how much so many of the um, fathers in my novels are, are very similar. Actually, they're all, they're all <laughs> <laughs> really, I think I need to like, Sort of vary my sort of characterological range here because I think well, certainly how many of the fathers who are given dialogue and are allowed to have a voice they're all very kind of actually they're all quite caring pacific you know dignified men and the fathers who aren't like that I tend to just not give much of a voice to which is quite a I didn't realize I had this quite this moralizing streak inside me um but I suppose that's what novels do, really. Like once you have a body of, once you start growing a body of work, it kind of like it's um, your novels kind of lay bare who you are without you even realizing it. And that was a surprise. That's something I understood from this book that actually your novels don't have your best interests at heart. That like your novel will actually quite happily betray you to your reader every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, just to come back to this question about writing characters whom you 
works for quite different uh, there are many ways of going about it I, I guess but my own instinct having worked as a journalist would be in your position maybe to interview my mom or my grandma and like ask questions and try to find out as much as I, I can before taking that leap and writing the character I'm curious did you do that did you learn anything interesting from your parents or grandparents or um so, so I guess as it's a story I've been hearing for quite a while um perhaps some of the it was already you know it was kind of like sediment it was kind of like there to some degree I don't I don't recall asking my no I didn't ask my parents or my grandparents like what they what they knew what what they knew of my great grandmother or or what and what else they knew of her. I asked basic stuff like what what might have it been like to you know, the practicalities of life back in 1920. What you know how did how how did they cook? How did they did they have you know what did they wear on their feet? Those kinds of things you know those practical things about that I might not have that I wouldn't have known about without doing a lot of and digging. But the actual makeup of how someone might think or how someone might behave. Um, or how someone might, you know, I, those those things. It never once crossed my mind to ask about those sides of things. I, do, I, I suppose because I just don't think those changed through much, especially because it was only seventy years ago. It wasn't that long ago, so I don't think those ideas um, would alter that much in, in the intervening period. Um, but certainly about, you know, practical things. I think I was always picking their brains. Yeah. Uh -huh. When did you go to the China Room? And I'm curious, the character that's based on yourself um, is on drugs, is on heroin. <laughs> I mean, I have to ask, is, were you ever on heavy drugs like that? Oh, God. Um, well, I first went, to, well, the China Room's always been there in my family. It's always been on the, it's on the farm. Um, and I say that, so, and it was, it was at one point called the women's room. So I was always a sense that that room at one point in the in the dim past belonged to or had, had something connected to um, women or the women sleeping there. Um, so that's when I suppose, so it was no great, it wasn't something that I felt like the China was something I discovered. Um, as for the unnamed narrator, yeah, in ev there are um, it's interesting. So the 2019 character who starts off writing um, the story at the age of 40, and then he's very much me. And inevitably, there are correspondences between the narrator's life and my life, between what he's gone through and what, what his parents have gone through and what my um, and what me and my parents have gone through. Um, but the interesting question for me and what makes, I think, this, that strand of the novel quite autofictional is how that 2019 self is refracted through time and th by and by memory and by language into these historical selves into these into the into the 18 year old narrator and beyond that into meher and also so we can look for me in the 18 year old narrator in the china room but equally we could also look for me in in radhika who the young woman that he develops a great deal of affection for so I actually think there's as much of me in radhika as there is in as there is in um the unnamed narrator, you know, she's a restive kind of um, person who believes who believes in that like, paying attention to things, and that's something I really um, identify with. And the other reason why I, I think it's important, um, why I think the novel is also fictional, is because I'm not interested in ideas of confessional truth. I'm not interested in memoir, but I am, inter I, am, I am interested in dramatic truth about what truth arises from the novel or from fiction. You know, I do believe in those, I do believe in that by watching characters going through, struggling through their lives in this hypothetical space, which we call a novel, and the novel is just boxes of thought, then that does give rise to um, a kind of truth, and that's the, that. It's that kind of truth that I get a lot of meaning from, and I think it's that kind of truth that still keeps pulling me towards um, reading novels and writing novels because it's dramatic truth I'm interested in rather than confessional truth. Uh -huh. and do Do you feel that all these characters you're writing about, this dramatic truth that, that emerges, is uh, all these characters are yourself? Yourself, like. Does, I think there's certainly. 
a part of me and all my characters that I write. I don't see how it could it could be. Otherwise, I don't see how you could have the. I mean, I just can't imagine how where the imagination would exist to be able to write a character that is completely delineated from your own self. I think that for me, there always has to be a bit of me in in all my characters just for, to enable me to just try to bring them to life. I don't see how I don't see how anyone could do it otherwise, really. Um, but maybe maybe there are some mega geniuses who can. But yeah. I, I, find it <laughs> I assume you mean this in a more in a more profound sense than just sort of the characters embodying certain traits. Sort of the character studies mathematics and is going to uni and all that sort of stuff. You're speaking of, to a more profound sort of connection with these characters. Yeah, um, I suppose I'm talking about um, the emotional posture of a person. Sort of like what's uh, you know not, not just how they hold themselves or how they bear themselves, but the things that I suppose. Um, give them meaning or how they look at life or a certain slant in the way they kind of think about things. I think that always has to come from, from the writer. Um, and I noticed you mentioned Radhika, it's sort of, I, I have a note here, I don't know if it means anything, but I noticed that she's one of the few characters, I believe, who has a last name uh, in, the, in the novel. Many characters, unless I'm totally wrong, unless I missed it in the first telling or something, most characters just seem to be referred to by their first name. Um, but I some special connection between you and Radhika. Yeah. You <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, either, either they only have a first name or they have no name at all or just an initial. Um, but yeah, Radhika Chaturvedi, because I think um, I just love her as a character. I think she was just, um, um, this, I suppose I've given her a surname because I do kind of, she, she's the one who, I suppose I'd want to be most like, you know, she's the one who I think is is genuinely escaping kind of the oppression and the forces upon her. She's the one who's kind of, um, she's kind of like, she's, she's, her, I find her personality just kind of ravishing. So I just want, I think I just, well, oh, I did just want to kind of um, give her the fullness of a name, you know, I think just to, just to honor that side of her, I think. Yeah. Right. Good. And I, I have, I've, sorry, go ahead. No, good spot. Well, I said good spot. Yeah. Yeah, I, I have a similar experience when I find myself writing who I'd like to be or who a I'd like a character to be. I, I think that's a very liberating experience. <laughs> yeah, and she's great. She's got so much just, um, just so much about her. I think that's just, she's, like I say, she's clever. She's bold in the same way that Meher is. There's lots of correspondence between her and, and Meher. And she's, um, but Radhika, because of the time she's living in and because of who she is, she's able to just break through that for that bit further. Absolutely, yes. So I guess in some sense, Radhika is kind of the modern day version of who yeah. had, been, had she, you know, had that context that would, yeah. would make her love corrupted, as you've mentioned before. Yeah, you're um, right. Yeah, no, it, that's beautiful. Uh, it's, uh, I'm realizing that now as, as we're talking, so that's great uh, yeah, she's, got, she's um yeah you're right if she if given a different time and rather say radhika okay, there's the isabel arch is mentioned in the book briefly just as like a little kind of almost like a a marker or a little like hint that isabel archer being from the henry james novel um portrait of a lady you know a character who um another character who was a clever woman who was brought down by a brutally patriarchal society and i wanted to sort of just put these signs in that these they, these women are 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 all connected in that way uh -huh. and i guess on a personal note uh i remember when we were talking in 2017 about this novel the couple of things that you had mentioned to me and i'm just curious how they evolved okay. the first was you sort of doppelgangers and um how some characters would have doppelgangers and they would have some significance and the second thing you told me, I remember I asked you, how is the novel going to end? And you said there was there's going to be a sunrise. And I noticed that you kept that in. <laughs> yeah, I did, yeah. There's a <laughs> yeah. Sunrise is always a good way to set novels, I think, in the sense of something, sort of like a new beginning. But in this book, I suppose it's it's kind of heartbreaking because it's also it's an end for for Meher in one sense as well. Um but yeah, the sunrise is still there. And there's another important sunrise with your name narrator. It's kind of that moment when he stops seeing his younger self running across the field and the orange yeah. beam. That's quite a transcendent moment for him. So sunrises for both these characters are, are 
you know, they signify um, a moment of um, development in some key way. And doppelgangers, you're right. Doppelgangers. So when I said that I started writing Mare Story, set it aside because I thought I couldn't write it or I had no read to write it. And then I started writing other novels this, with this unnamed narrator. That no, those other novels all had doppelgangers in. So I was, I was writing kind of a doppelganger narrative because it's such a, such a potent image. And as you know, it's quite, you know, in Indian, in Indian mythology, it's, it's quite, a, it's, it's seen as like a harbinger of death. And it's quite a um, important kind of like a um, um, leitmotif. Um, so I was writing this novel with these doppelgangers, but then slowly these doppelgangers started changing and I realized I was writing versions of myself in the sense I became the doppelganger. Um, so that's kind of like how the 99 strand sort of came to be. And then, and then these doppelgangers were getting, I'd say just looking more and more like me until I realized that there's no point having a doppelganger unless I am, I am going to be the doppelganger in this book. So that's how the doppelganger changed from an actual doppelganger, a double, into into this not, not unnamed narrator in in the book, but the idea of doppelganger has not left me undone. I'm I'm still it's still kind of gnawing at my mind. There's something about this that image which I find really kind of troubling, but also quite kind of fruitful. So I'm, I almost think my next novel, those doppelgangers may return as actual doppelgangers. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Amazing. Cool. I look forward to reading. So we have some questions from the audience that have come in. And uh, so I'll just read out three of them here. We have from Carmen, Carmen Garson Shumway. She asks, what was your favorite quarantine activity? Then number two, from an anonymous attendee, uh, I read somewhere that you'd never read a novel until you were 18 years old. What inspired you to become a writer yourself? And the third question from Jackie McBride, was it difficult to have one part of the book set in 1929 and the other part in 1999. Why such a difference in time period? Okay, my favorite quarantining activity. Well, I was doing a lot of homeschooling. I've got um, three young children, so there's a lot of, I didn't feel like there was much free time to do much outside of that, but I do love running and I live quite near a national park and um, there's lots of running trails. So I did manage to um, get out and run quite a lot and I quite like running it kind of just it obliterates any other thoughts and any kind of analysis I can do and I feel like, I feel at, at my most present in the world when I'm when I'm just out running by myself so that was probably my favorite mm -hmm. um, activity which I do outside of lockdown anyway um, the second question was um, just remind me Anjan what what inspired you to become a writer you've never read a novel oh uh, yeah um, so yeah, it's true. I hadn't read a novel until I was 18 and about to say as, as that moment of when I did start reading novels, I did feel like a dam had just burst open and I was kind of overtaken, overwhelmed with storytelling and the meaning, which I've spoken about already, the meaning that uh, I get from mm -hmm. storytelling and fiction and that, you know, that connection between the reader and the writer and I think at some point, once you know, I started, once I was had been reading quite heavily and reading for you know several years, I started just asking questions of the of the writer beyond you know of the writer beyond the page. So why did you do it that way? Why do you write the story in that way and not this way? Why make this decision and not that decision? I think once you start asking those kind of technical questions of the book, then it's probably not a big leap to want to start having a go yourself and thinking that you could also put together this clockwork mechanism that will result in result in a book um and it's also isn't it is an extension of the idea of meaning from from writing from reading novels as well um so yeah I, just, I wanted to see if I could do it I wanted to see like you know I love this thing I love this I love reading novels I love this thing called reading novels it clearly does something to the insides of me I want to write them as well um oh. and my third why that big time difference 70 years um I suppose because it is because it is the story is loosely based on or you know the trigger was my great grandmother's story so I had to it kind of that kind of dictated the time and um and I put it into 1929 because I because I, I don't know when she would have like precisely when she would have lived I, I guess it would have been the 1920s well it would have been the 1920s but I put it in 1929 because there was just some key um 
elements around the independence movement, which I knew I wanted to draw on for the narrative. So 1929 was fixed. And then um, the narrator goes back in, the unnamed narrator, he's in India in 1999 because he's 18. He's, it's a summer before university. He's just about to discover reading novels. There's parallels with my own trip to India when I was 18 as well. Um, so yeah, so those were, I suppose that kind of dictated the 70 year um, difference in time. It wasn't something that kind of um, I put on the book. It was something that the book, the book dictated for itself. Oh, it's based, uh, dictated by real life in a sense, your own experience, your own past and- Yeah. India. Yeah, it's based on, yeah. So the eight, yeah. So I went to India when I was 18 and that dictated that strand or that time. And then I decided 1929 because I wanted it to, I knew because I, I wanted it to align with some events in the Indian independence movement. Mm -hmm. so we have one more question, uh, last question from the audience. Do you have a writing routine and did it change during the pandemic? What would you suggest for someone who's struggling with writer's block? Okay, did I have a writing routine? I am, um, well, on the days when I went to days when the schools were closed, I, you know, there was no chance of getting any writing done at all. Um, luckily, the book was pretty much done and with my editor just before lockdown started in, in the UK, at least. Um, so I was mostly editing during um, lockdown and editing. I find much, I don't need that, that, that kind of clear, empty space of silence for, you know, three or four hours when I'm editing. I can edit around various things going on in the house. Um, but usually my routines are right from 10 till 2 you know about three or four hours max anything more i start just you know you start just coming out with i start coming out with gibberish um and then that's about it and i try to do that on most days most weekdays certainly um or advice if you've got writer's block oof um you know there's really you know there's really nothing more to say other than you know the extraordinary act of writing a novel can only be achieved through the the very ordinary grim persistence of just sitting down and forcing it forcing it to forcing it onto the page there's nothing more i find sometimes going away reading some novels which you or reading some writing which you really love and which you know really mean something to you that can sometimes help um music occasionally can spark something i find um but really it's just turning up always turning up and just and and if once you've got something down, you can always, it's, it's commonly said, you can always change it, but it's just getting that, getting that first thing down. But if you're really struggling, I find, I find sitting in solitude with the work tends to bring things around for me eventually. Um, but also it's going for a walk. That's kind of, that kind of solitary activity is usually what I, what I need. Yeah. I remember I can add, I remember, um, you said something similar when I, in 2017, when I was struggling to write and I mentioned to you over lunch, I believe it was. And I think you'd say to me, well, if you just sit with it and take a step back, usually mm. things will sort themselves out. Yeah, I, hopefully. Yeah, 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 I thought that was really uh, helpful actually and kind of wise because often stuck, you're trying to force something, but your point was to just sort of take a step back and look at it. I find that and then hopefully it's like they start to resolve themselves in a way and it just gives your mind that space to just see 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 the whole sometimes I just get so caught up in like the minutiae it's just like what am I trying to and, and sometimes the answer might be it's not working and I have to start again and it's that's awful when that happens um but also necessary but oftentimes I just say it will it will it will come it will come good narrative is really generous narrative will give you the answers but you have to give it the time to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Morgan, can I ask one more question? Just yeah. Sure. I guess one sure. more question. Sure. From personally, I'm curious. So now that you finished this book, or you finished it a year ago, and you've been editing it, curious how are you spending your time, and what are you thinking about working on next? Uh, do you have a novel already in mind, or, or a book, or uh, in, at what stage is it? Yeah, I've just. Um, I'm only a few thousand words into the next book, which is quite unusual for me. Normally it takes me longer than this before I'll, before I'll home in on the next, on the next book, but um, an idea, a thought seemed to crash into me and I wanted to start 
getting it down and it involves doppelgangers and Junta, we'll see where it goes. We'll see excellent, where it goes. Excellent. <laughs> I'm glad I mentioned it. it all comes full circle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, well, that was a great question to end on. So I would like to thank both of you for being here on the behalf of Politics and Prose. Um, I'd also like to thank our audience for watching. And I'd also like to remind you all to purchase your copy of China Room from Politics and Prose. The stores are open and we're also available online. Your purchases are what it makes it possible for us to do these events and we appreciate your support. All right, so everyone have a great evening.